Hi everyone, uh, I, my name is Richard Kuhn. Um, I'm chairman, uh, well past chairman, now patron of a group called Angel Investors Marlborough. Uh, we're a group of uh, just over 180 members based in Blenheim and we are really an angel club. We invest in small companies. Um, so uh, a very exciting space, but you know, a, uh, but a certainly an interesting area in terms of governance uh, and that's really why I'm here today. Right, we're going to talk about key terms and agreements in angel investment. Hi, I'm Mark Benicevic. Welcome to Governance Bites. And as you just heard, once again, I have the privilege to spend time with Richard Kuhn. Richard, thank you very much for your yeah, time. You're welcome. Richard was recently appointed an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit for his services to business and philanthropy. He is a co-founder, a former co-founder and director of a Sovereign, which is a, the largest life insurance company in New Zealand that was bought recently by AIA, and then co-founder and director at Partners Life, uh, which was sold to Daiichi Insurance uh, in November 2022 for a billion dollars. He is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, uh, has an MBA from Harvard, uh, so very, very experienced director and business person, and now, as you heard, he's involved in Angel Investors Marlborough and on a number of boards of companies he's invested in as a part of that. And what we're here to talk about today is the terms and agreements that are involved in angel investment. So as a director of a company, if you're looking to seek investment for the business, some of these areas will be particularly useful to you. So to start off with Richard, can you talk us through the process of completing an investment? So if you've decided to invest in a new business, what's the process of investing? Yeah, well we, uh, we, we have screening teams and, and they, they go through and then the, the, the companies come down and pitch to us and we work out an offer we're going to make to them, uh, including the, what value and, and within and we, we give them what's called a term sheet. And the term sheet is, you know, perhaps 10 pages and it la lays out exactly wh how, what the nature of, na nature of the relationship should be so that there are, there are no surprises uh, for anyone. Um, and that term sheet uh, is not only important for us, but we're often leading an investment where we might involve other in angel, angel groups and we can then go around and share that term sheet with other groups around the country. Uh, if we need them to come and make in the total amount of capital that's that's required, um, and that usually this this term sheet um, will say you know we're going to have ordinary shares or preference shares, we're going to value the company at this level. Uh, these are the sorts of decisions that have to come back to the board or the shareholders. Um, and it would de define something about uh, the, who's going to be on the board. Uh, might involve something about employment terms and um, any particular what are called uh, vesting rights because quite often when you see a company and they come to you and the, the owners own 100% of the shares mm. is you don't want to put money in alongside them as ordinary shareholders. Uh, and then if it all collapsed, they then take all the money. Yes. <laughs> so you have to have what's called vesting, So, which is you basically say to them, well, look, you keep 50% of your shares, but the other 50% goes into a pool and you earn those over the next four years. Okay. Um, and if you, for whatever reason, decide not to continue in the business, you don't get those shares, but they're there available for whoever we need to bring in to replace you to run the business. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a very key part. Um, so the, the things you, you cover also in the agreement are what's called preference. So that means that if things go wrong, who at least who, who gets paid first. Uh, and then the and vesting is the other, the other key one. The um, point you raised about vesting is an interesting one. If they're held uh, and not owned legally by those founders mm. for a period of time. Who actually holds the legal interest in those shares before they vest? Uh, 
Well, they're, they're sort of held by the company, that, but it's, it's a bit like an option scheme, really. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, somebody yeah. doesn't get taxed like an option scheme. <laughs> Uh, it gets, it, it's they're, they're sort of they're, they're treated as they own them, but they don't have any rights to them. And they actually, what there is is a buyback in, in place. So, so basically, they're forced to sell them for a dollar right. if they if they leave. Ah, oh, yes, okay, okay, right. That that makes yeah. sense. Um, the question I was just going to ask has jumped out of my head. So while I'm thinking of it, oh, actually, yes, that was the question I was going to ask. When you invest uh, into a, an entity like this. Do you tend to create a nominee company to own those shares and all the angels? Yeah, with the within nominee? AIM, we have AIM investment, uh, AIM, AIM, AIM invest, investors, Marlborough, so Angel Investors Marlborough nominee company, and that nominee company holds all its share, all the shares in all the companies for its members. Okay. And we ha we have a deed of commitment between the nominee company and the individual investor, yes. basically. Uh, saying what the rights are, and we we still have to, have to if there's any votes and whatever, we still have to s seek their instruction as to how they want to vote. So, but it is purely a nominee. It just uh, uh, makes it a lot easier, uh, and 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 obviously a lot of companies, you know, if there are going to be twenty of us investing, um, you know, you get caught by the takeover rules in New Zealand if you have fifty investors. Right. So okay. so most of them we want to keep keep away from that problem. Um, and, and we do that through using a nominee. Right, okay. So is it one nominee company that then invests in a number of different companies? Yes, it's the same nominee company. Is that a, okay, yeah, but yeah. the uh, but anyway, and, yeah. investors invest in different businesses, so the nominee company would say, this particular individual has got money invested in this company yeah, and yeah, this company. Yes, it keeps all those records. Right, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. And then uh, the nominee company, uh, what, Potential works, but would have its own board of directors uh, that then yeah, it talks has, to yeah, the yeah. investors of a particular yeah. company around yeah. decision making. Doesn't it doesn't make any decisions? The investing company is purely a, a nominee structure, right? But right. yes, it does have a board. Um, okay. It gets a bit problematic when you sell a company <laughs> because of the money laundering side of it, because often they want the money to go directly to the individual beneficial shareholders. They don't want it going through the nominee. So right. that does be create a problem sometimes, right. but we we can solve it usually through a solicitor's bank account. Yes, and then you just you know, you, um, yeah. if you're an anti-money laundering and counter finance and terrorism reporting entity, yeah. then you simply have to do your risk um, matrix yeah. and get a review yeah. every couple of years and so forth. Three years now, isn't it? But we we use a, a, a product called a, a Catalyst, which is yes. uh, basically New Zealand's. Uh, Small, small. Oh, basically, it's a it's a regulated stock exchange for small to medium sized enterprises, right. and we use that structure so that uh, all our members are, are AML checked, yes. and they are on there, and then all the investments are done through there. Right. So okay. It's a great, it's a great a, system that maintains the registry. The Caitlin maintains the registry. Okay. Right. And then yeah. that, I, I believe Catalyst then has uh, trade windows, doesn't it? Yes. So it has a secondary market. So it raises money for companies, uh, and the, all our individuals go in, as do other investors. I think they've got about five and a half thousand investors on the system now. Right. Um, and uh, we uh, and the secondary trading is done on there through auctions. Okay. But uh, one of the important things as a, as an angel investor is is you know you're not necessarily wanting to hold a share for twenty years. That's right. So you need some liquidity, and yeah. and certainly products like. Uh, uh, or, or platforms such as Catalyst enable you to get that liquidity in your in your shares. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, but coming back to the the agreements that are involved in mm. this process, what are the key legal agreements that you need when you're investing? Uh, you've got to have a constitution, so that sort of sort of defines the types of shares, the rights of the different classes of shares, transfers, um, and things called tag along and drag along, which uh, basically says if if someone wants to share that sell a large amount of shares, sometimes other shareholders will have rights to go with them. Right. And drag along means if someone comes on and wants to buy the companies and some of them want to sell, there's a minimum percentage that have to agree to sell before they can drag the others Everyone with them. It. But it does mean that if you know 75% of the, of the shareholders want to sell, they can force the other 25 to go along with it. So you yes. won't have people holding out for, you know, you know, basically yes. hosti being holding hostages, all of that. Right. Um, so that's your that's your first main document is your constitution. Uh, then you have a the shareholder agreement, which sort of 
everybody agrees what the objectives are, what sort of board it's going to have, um, the, the management, what, what budgets, how it's going to report, uh, how it's going to raise capital, uh, and there are things uh, called anti-dilutes. Um, so that is something that says, if I come and invest and pay a dollar for my shares, and in a year's time you bring shareholders in at 50 cents, I can have all mine repriced to 50 cents. So okay. that is quite common in young startups because it, 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 is, it is an art rather than a science to value a company, and you might have got it wrong. Yes. And, and, and things can change quite rapidly. and uh, It would be somewhat unfair if people went in at one price and then suddenly a load of others came in at a much lower price. So you yes. have that protection. It's not forever. It's often one or two years of anti-dilution okay. just to give you that protection. But they, usually we will look for that to be in there. Vesting, that's also important. I think I mentioned that. Um, so that, um, that it just makes sure that there are shares of if, if a founder want, wants to walk away, that there are shares then available for, a, for his replacement. Um, and a non-compete is usually important because so much of the value of the business is in the people you're, you're putting your money into. Yes. And if you don't want to put your money in, then the next day they walk away and do it, the same thing somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> so you usually have a, a two-year non-compete clause. So that's the, the shareholder agreement. You have a subscription agreement, where that's really to do just with the issue of the shares, um, confirming what information has been provided to you and what warranties the company is offering. So if, if you've been misled in any way or something like that, um, then there is an opportunity for you to get something back. But you know, that's, you're, hoping that, you're hoping that <laughs> never happens. <Yes. laughs> um, there's usually a founders agreement, because most of our companies have one or two founders. Um, that will be that the intellectual prep property is in the company, it's not in their names. Right. Um, the vesting thing I, I've mentioned, usually you put transfer restrictions on founders shares, so you say look, you know, we want to make sure you guys are locked in, so maybe you can only sell 10% of your shares over a year or, or no, no share sales for three years yes. or just something uh, that's reasonable. Um, and any um, any uh, any non competes and, uh, and and usually the board and what the voting rights will be um, uh, and and often founders do have some special voting rights um, you know they they might have both of the founders uh, being on the board so you you have to look at that balance of board and voting yes. um, because you don't want something pushed through that the majority of the people who put the money in don't like yes. <laughs> um, yes. And then fi the final document, most companies will have uh, an employee share option program, an ESOP. Uh, in New Zealand, that's typically 10 to 20% of the total equity mm -hmm. in an ESOP. Um, and it will cover, you know, not necessarily all employees, but certainly the most senior employees. Uh, it is a good incentive. Uh, it's not very favorably taxed in New Zealand, unfortunately. Hopefully that'll change. Yes. Um, and it's usually based, well, it's, it goes one or two ways. It's either a time served type of thing, which sort of says, look, if you're still in here in four years' time, you can exercise these options. Or there might be a performance based, which sort of says, if we get to this position of turnover or this value as a company, your shares can vest. They right. can, you know, your options can vest. Mm -hmm. you know, so it, it's much more determined as to how well the company does as opposed to just a time thing. Yes. But those are really the, the, the sort of five key documents and we'll make, you know, they're, they're pretty well will be standard um, to, for every company to have one. And, and they're generally, there are in New Zealand some, some reasonable standards. Some of the law companies have them on their, on their sites. Um, and the Angel Association in New Zealand has a set of documents on its site, so often most of us will use uh, the, the standards. Right. Yeah, and then it saves a lot of time. Everybody's familiar with them. Yeah, uh, so and then you'll be able to just change little terms and things yeah. slightly. To, to and they're designed to be fair. Um, they're, they're designed to be quite well balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, 
between the founders and the investors. Well, that, that have to be right, because if yeah. you're the founder of an entity, you don't want to hand over control to these investors, otherwise you're <laughs> no. making me... Well, they're, they're, you know, you've got to think about it. They're investing in you as a person. You know, yes. They don't want to come and control your company unless you go totally rogue. Mm. Uh, you know, they <laughs> you have to allow for, th you know, the, the, that someone, uh, a founder might go rogue or decide it's not for them and they want to do something else. And you've got to allow for that in, in whatever agreements you've got. Um, but, uh, you know, you try to be fair and it is very much a partnership. Absolutely, yes. You, you mentioned uh, in our earlier conversation around uh, when, in some occasions, you'd see, see a seat on the board and in other cases you weren't. Uh, you wouldn't. Mm. You mentioned uh, in particular that in some cases you might have founders without any board support around them, without an existing board structure. In other cases, there may be a little bit more structure involved. When would you uh, seek a board seat and, and what would the circumstances look like? <laughs> well, I guess you've got to be conscious of the fact that there are liabilities as a director. Mm. Uh, you could, and, and these are early stage companies where you know people will tell you that 70% of new businesses go bust. So you don't go in lightly to become a director. Mm. Um, and you know, if but if you get heavily involved in the business, it probably doesn't make much difference whether you're a director because you'll be deemed to be a de facto director. Yes. Um, so, uh, and I have to say that we are, we do like to be involved in the businesses, but not to the level where you'd be like an executive or something like that. But you could get involved in major decision making. And you do, when you're a director of these companies, need to make sure that you are solvent at all times. Of and course. we do make sure to, uh, I know not a number of companies I'm involved with make sure they record that in their minutes at every meeting, that they have reviewed the situation and agree they're solvent. Right, okay. Because, you know, otherwise you are taking risks as an individual uh, director. Um, with it aim, we appoint uh, um, basically uh, an, invest, an investor rep to every investment. Um, and that investor rep may or may not become a director. We may have a situation where uh, we find someone else to be an independent director who we feel has got much more skills than we offer in that particular area and we would encourage them. We like to see independence on every board. Right. But it's not necessarily us, it's the person with the right skills. Yes. That's the most, most thing. Um, and we, you know, uh, and I did mention before, we, we do want to make sure we're getting regular reporting. We want to know if there's a problem. Uh, and certainly having that independent person on the board um, helps us you know, get a better understanding you know, without any bias yes. as to how well things are going. You, you also mentioned, I think, in our, our earlier conversation that one of the things you do as an angel investment team is uh, create a governance structure if there isn't one already. Yes. Uh, so yeah. making sure that there is some sort of board in place. Uh, as you say, your investor rep may or may not sit on the board. You might get an independent person in if it's got, they've got a different mm. skill set. But certainly setting up that regular reporting cycle on the governance is a, is a big part of what you do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, you, you just set the board timetable for the year. You know, you, know you want to have a str good strategy session. It might be a couple of days off-site. You want to do that. You know you're going to have to produce some accounts and have an AGM. You know you want to do a risk management matrix at some stage. You know there's going to be some need for a pay review because usually the board were involved on the, the senior director, the senior, the managing director's pay review. Right. Uh, we Usually with the small companies you don't set up a remuneration committee and you don't set up an audit committee. It just becomes part it of the board. tends to be just all part of what the board does. Right. Um, and yeah, so you do, you just do those, those, those sort of key things and make sure they're covered in the, in the year. Another question for you in terms of the fundraise itself. Uh, generally, uh, you know, as you said before, some of the companies that come to you don't have a revenue stream yet, or they'll be very early stages of revenue, and generally a startup will be in a loss-making scenario for a period of time. So when they're coming to you asking for money, uh, I expect they're, they're wanting kind of six months or 12 months worth of money to create a runway, uh, but they don't need all that money on day one. Do you, does the angel investment team tend to drip feed the money in, or is it provided in a lump sum? And no, we we up? tend to uh, know they're going to come back for money. So uh, you know, a typical company may have 
like five raises. Right. Um, we'll probably make sure they've got enough for six to 12 months. Um, but we know they're going to come back. Right. Um, and you don't tend to try to define all the terms now and, and, and let them draw it over a three year period <laughs> because the valuations and the situation is going to change quite dramatically. Yes. Um, if they do really well, uh, they could be coming back in 12 months time at two to three times the valuation they had originally. Mm. Um, and that's fine. I mean, often as, as an investor, if, if we get new investors coming in at twice the money we went in at, uh, you feel good about that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and normally you'd be supportive as well. So you're, no, you're normally put a bit more money in. You, you usually don't put quite so much money in on the second and third rounds as you did in the first round. Mm -hmm. It just seems to be the nature of things. Um, so uh, might be half the money they ever want to raise maybe in the first round, but then the balance will be over a few a few rounds after that. Okay. Um, okay. But it's it's you know that it's going to be a long journey of capital raising. Very few raise and and are profitable in a year. No, of course. <laughs> yes. Have you learned any hard lessons that you could have avoided with some of these agreements that you talked about earlier? Um, yeah, I would. I would. Uh, I would say um, the vesting has probably been our biggest area. Uh, you do find that you can meet, uh, you know, a, a great team, um, and they're working well together. But under the stresses of building a new business, that team may not stay together. Right. And uh, we've had quite a few uh, situations where an initial founder um, has has, you know gone and that may be their choice or it may be someone else's choice but you know the partnerships don't necessarily stay together and you've got to make sure that um, the vesting is covered that you've you've thought about that situation occurring um, and there have been quite a few situations where that hasn't been covered properly right um, and it can be very very difficult to say to somebody well, look, we want you out, um, and we want you know to take your shares off you for, you know, a small sum, um, and they turn around and say, well, no, I want X, yes. um, and quite rightly, because mm. you didn't allow for it. So that has been probably one of our biggest learning lessons is is where we haven't put the vesting rights in place, and we we make sure that we don't miss that one now. Right. Um, I mean, it was. I mean, certainly when we when we we started, and we do come sometimes, just get asked to participate in a deal that another group has put together, and you know, so maybe the terms are a bit softer than we would like, but we still see that it's a good opportunity, and you know, you can't really change things, so mm -hmm. we we have to accept that maybe it's not a perfect agreement, um, but that's that's usually the. The, the you know I think we've we've been on enough journeys now over you know a seven year period um, that we sort of we we sort of know what the things are that can happen and to and to allow for those in the agreements. Yes, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, uh, and through through no one's particular fault, things don't necessarily turn out as you hoped, and you but you've got to you've got to allow for that. Yes, right. So it's about being prepared, yeah. planning in advance. Yeah, what absolutely. Happen. As you said before, an interesting point that, point that you raised that the shares would legally sit in the ha of the ownership of that founder, for example, but there's an agreement that they would have to sell a portion of them at a lower price. Yes, that's right. That's a yeah, yeah. yes, the right yes. Right. So, so that that is the, a very important aspect of putting the the, the 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 deals together. As is liquidation preference. They're probably the two the two absolute biggies because often the founders will have ordinary shares and the new investors will have preference shares. Right, yes, yes. Um, as something you actually mentioned before we started recording was uh, you alluded to some, the difference between being on the board of a startup versus being on the board of a more established company. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean when you join an established company um, you, you, you often don't have any financial you know shareholding necessarily you know you've asked to, to, to join the board of a bank or something and it's much more to do with pure governance are we doing the right things are we going through the right processes are we making decisions in the right way mm -hmm. and there's no personal interest 
But when you are an investor uh, going onto a board of one of these young companies, you know, you've, you've put some tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line investing in this company, and then you're also trying to be an independent director. And, and <laughs> you don't know that you're getting that balance right. So, you know, there is some conflict there. Clearly, if you've got money on the line with a big upside, you might be more open to risk than someone who hasn't got a shareholding. Yes. Um, and I think it's quite important to see if you can get um, you know, a mixture. So if, if I went onto a board um, and had a big shareholding, I would like to see one or two other independents without a big shareholding, just right. to make sure we've got that, that balance right. Yes, yes. And you also mentioned before that on a startup board, you wouldn't tend to have the subcommittees like your remuneration, your audit subcommittee, it all can, tends to get done. Oh right yeah, board, so. just, well, you're probably not having an audit at all as a small company, mm. uh, but yes, the account side and, and the, rem, the, rem, the REM committee will be the independents, you obviously yes. won't have the the, the, the team on the management team on there, uh, but the audit would be everybody, yes. um, and the risk the risk committee. If you wouldn't normally in a big company, you have a separate risk committee. Well, yeah. you wouldn't there. They that's all part of your normal board. But we do separate. We do stipulate one particular meeting of the year to be our risk meeting, yes. so people can prepare for that properly. And I, in, in the established companies, you'd have a lot more support as well. Like you'd have a risk team internally within the company that's reporting to the risk committee. Yeah. Whereas yeah. in a startup, there's no risk team. Right? No, it's no, just it's the probably, team. You know, so you've got to get your hands a bit dirty. You know, some of them. I, I mean. They're they're, they're small companies, but some of them might have like 50 staff. They're not. Yeah. They're not. I mean, there are tiny ones where it is just the, two, the team of two. Yes. But they do grow. You know, over a number of years, they can be um, 50. In fact, I was had a meeting earlier today. Uh, they have now got 90 staff in right. a startup. That's actually uh, getting very good. <laughs> there are I've got the stats. There's 605,000 enterprises in New Zealand and under 3,000 of them have more than 100 employees. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it won't be long <laughs> before they become one of the largest companies in the country. Absolutely, no. <laughs> one final question then for you. Uh, as an experienced director, if you were to sit down with somebody who is fairly new to the governance uh, process, being very, fairly new as a director, what advice would you give them? Uh, I think you've, you've, you've got to work out why you're there. Um, and how can you specifically add value to this to this company? Um, most of these young companies have got loads of gaps, <laughs> and with your experience as a new director, you probably can fill some of those gaps. So, uh, but it, it's important to clarify that with them and make sure that they know that that's your input. Um, and the the other the other part is with these companies. Um, Actually, being a founder of a company is, 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 can be quite a lonely experience. Um, and when you, when, when you go into the company, you are becoming a mentor. And I think that's important also to recognize. You may not necessarily be the only mentor. And part of what I do when I go into a company is find out what other mentors I can introduce them to. Because mm -hmm. I think you can have no, never have too many mentors as someone who's running a business. You can just, someone who's got some experience and can just help uh, you make some of the hard decisions you're gonna have to. Um, that's important. Um, so this, that's, yeah, I mean, those are probably the, the key point. You, and you do become a member of the team. Uh, it is very different to being on the audit of a big company where yes. you, you're just turning up and, and yes, you are involved in the decisions, but you're not that closely involved uh, as you are in a small company yes. so just you but you you've got to also try to maintain that that bit of distance because you are you know an independent as, uh, as independent as you can be Your job type of director fresh eyes right yeah yeah than. and you are trying to help them not make a mistake but sometimes you you ha have to make some hard decisions i have had such decisions where um i've been on a board and needed to decide that um um one of the founders was wrong uh, in that position, and 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 you know we needed to push for change, um, and because you are looking after the shareholder interests, so yes. you you have to you've got quite a few roles you're playing and quite a few allegiances mm -hmm. you're having to balance. Right. Well, Richard, again, thank you very much for your time. It's been okay. great to catch up and have a conversation. I appreciate you. Uh, you 
spending some time with me while you've been oh, up very welcome. Months. I'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay. And we'll see you next episode. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of Governance Bites. We have more episodes on YouTube and your favorite podcast channel, where I interview directors and experts on various topics relating to boards of directors and governance. We'd love to see you back, and please like, subscribe, and share the videos and podcasts.